Good evening, hello everybody. So wonderful, God bless you, so good to see you. It's really a pleasure to see you tonight. I wasn't so sure how many show up and it's a really nice turnout. God bless you, it's so a, 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 a special feeling and the, uh, the idea of cantorial and the history of the cantorial world as you know, it's a touch not only to my heart, but the heart of many people. Um, uh, Mr. Barahat is a, a fellow that dedicated himself for four decades or more just to search this important subject. The history of the Khazanus, there's so much depth in there, and those of you who remember those years, not only the old years of Kusavitsky and many others, but the old years that based on the story of the key a, um, composer and, um, and the cantor and leader was the late Yosele Rosenblatt. So it gives me a great pleasure and honor to introduce Mr. Charlie Bernard here tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm always curious when I speak in different locations. Uh, are any of you from New Jersey? We have any New Jersey? Where? Uh, oh, that's not New Jersey. <laughs> 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 that's that's Central New Jersey. Yeah. Anybody from Newark? Yes. You went to Winkway High School? Yes. What year? By 1957. Well, I graduated in 54. <laughs> so, uh, Winkway High School. Uh, if you heard of Winkway High School, uh, 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 Roth, Philip Roth, uh, was two years ahead of me. Uh, he was uh, from Newark and uh, he describes life growing up in New York, and if you read all his books, uh, setting, uh, every one of us from New York recognize uh, uh, the places that he mentions. Uh, I've been collecting old Victrolas for about 50 years. Uh, I had a major collection of maybe 20, 25 different machines. Uh, I'll show you some of them uh, in part of the presentation. Uh, over the years, uh, I used to get phone calls that uh, a uh, parent or grandparent would pass away, and they find dozens of these old records, and they don't know what to do with them. So I, as a collector, I just kept taking them and taking them, never listening to them though. In 1977, I was involved with Simon Wiesenthal, uh, sharing a co-chairing a dinner, and uh, uh, I, I'm in my car and I hear Jewish music, and that was the beginning of something called uh, uh, JM in the AM, so you may have uh, heard the uh, show, Nachum Siegel show. Uh, and the young fellow says, uh, if you have any announcements, give me a call. So I called him and I said, will you announce this dinner? And it was Peshert. It was faded. He said, come in tomorrow morning. I'll interview you. And after the interview, I said, I have all these old records. I want to give them to you. I think your listeners might be happy to hear the old cantorial in Yiddish. I don't know anything about it. He said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a half hour, 45 minutes every Friday morning. You come in. You'll play it for a pre-Shabbos show. So I used to bring up a wind-up controller and I used to hold the microphone. If you remember, there were doors in the old uh, machines. Uh, we'll show you that later. Uh, and I got the bug, and uh, I now have 13,000 albums of Jewish music uh, in my collection. Uh, part of it has already been donated to the uh, State of Israel Sound Archives, and I, hopefully the, the rest of the collection will get there. Uh, but I've been broadcasting for 40 years. Uh, the last eight years on the internet, I do a two-hour show every week. Uh, I have people in 35 countries, South Africa, Australia, Israel, uh, listening to this program. No commercials. It's one hour of cantorial and one hour of a, a mix of Jewish music. And I have a little card for you if you have a computer and if you're so moved, uh, you might be interested in that. Yes, the Rosenblatt <coughs> was the right person at the right time in history in terms of uh, cantorial music. He was born in 1882. I'm going to get into his life uh, in more depth, but I want to first talk about sound, the invention of sound, because this played a major role in, in uh, his life. Prior to 1900, what did uh, anybody do for entertainment, particularly a Jew, if they wanted entertainment? They went to shul. 
because the only place they could hear singing, especially if you're Orthodox, uh, was to hear a chazan. Uh, and uh, there was no TV, there was no radio, uh, of course. Uh, and Edison, the Jersey guy, uh, first experimented with the phonograph in the uh, late 1800s. He got his first patent uh, in 1878. Uh, and vaudeville was the main source of entertainment prior to 1900, actually 1910. It died out, as you'll see, uh, after the uh, invention of radio, uh, but it hung around for a few years. But prior to 1900, vaudeville was where people went for their entertainment. Again, there were no movies. There were silent movies that came out. <coughs> I'm mentioning this because you'll see how it plays into Rosenblatt's life later on. This is uh, Caruso. His first recording was in 1903. Uh, he was the first person to sell a million records of one particular selection. It's Vesti La Juba. Now, to understand how uh, recordings were made, if you see this horn here, the musician sat, or the singer, sat in front of a horn. The vibrations went down to a stylus, and it made the mold. And that's how records were made. They weren't made electronically. They were what's called acoustically made. So the first records were cylinder records. This is an actual, I'm going to pass one of these around. This is 110 years old. This is two minutes. Two minute record, it was absolutely revolutionary. And the, the uh, quality of the sound depended upon how big the instrument was. Of course, this is a tiny little 1905 cylinder record player, and it's, it's spring wound. In other words, it's, these were not electric. You have this little key, and you wind it up. Yeah. I'm full of 
saw that uh, that was a, uh, uh, an old record player. It was not electronic, it was spring wound. So after about three or four plays, you had to wind it up again uh, so that it would play uh, further, further recordings. I mentioned the discovery in 1908 that you could use two sides. And here you see uh, the floor model uh, record, pl uh, record players. A lot of the homes, uh, some of you may have had them in, in your homes, your basements, and grandparents had them. Uh, yes? What do they call them in Yiddish? Okay, and uh, there you see um, a picture of uh, Caruso uh, in an ad for the Mitchell. Uh You see that in 1911, Edison tried to compete with the discs. He came out with a this is called a diamond disc uh, record. And I'm going to pass this around. The reason it failed is you can see how heavy it is. If you had 20 of them, <laughs> you couldn't lift them up. They, they, were very, they were great records. In 1911, it's called a diamond disc uh, uh, record. That's what they used to call the record. So in 1913, they stopped making Victrolas with horns. So if you see, uh, well, and see Jews with horns, you have a problem also. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm going to come back. I have a comedy presentation that I do. I'm only going to keep this serious tonight, though. Uh, no more external horns in 1913. So if you go into a, an old uh, antique store and you see a photograph with horns, you know, it's 104 years old, at least, because they, they stopped making that uh, in 1913. Uh, Charlie Chaplin had his first film in 1915. Uh, you'll hear later how that intertwines with Rosenblatt's life, uh, Charlie. Now, in World War I, there were advances in radio technology. Remember, there was no radio prior to 1920. Uh, radio first came around 1921, 22, or 23. And then you'll see how this affects Rosie Blatt's life. Now, here's the emergence of radio. And I think I speak for a lot of people in this room. Remember when television first came out, the first person who had a TV set suddenly became the most popular person. <laughs> you see everybody who's around the radio. They're sitting around the radio listening to this incredible invention uh, of not having to have a phonograph player, but you can actually just turn on a switch and listen to music. Uh, that's in the early 20s. Now, the major advance in 1925 was from what they call acoustical, where they, they recorded by standing in front of a horn, then it became electric, electronic. And the way they recorded then was the, the way they do it now, with a uh, amplifier and then you have a uh, microphone and speakers. That's why prior to 1925, there are no records of great symphonies, great operas, because you couldn't get them in front of a horn. You know, uh, that's, that's, a, that's, uh, that's not that long ago. And there you see, of course, on the left, uh, the uh, um, musicians in front of a, a horn. That, that was the, the mic amplifier speaker. Now, this is interesting. These old records were 78 RPM, that means revolutions per minute. However, <coughs> this is an index of Rosenblatt's recordings, and if you look at the yellow, the yellow were the only ones that were recorded at 78 RPM. <coughs> A lot of them were 79, 84, 85. Now this caused a lot of problems because suppose you put a record that was recorded at 85 revolutions per minute on a record machine that is set for 78. So actually all the machines had a little gizmo that you would just adjust so that it would sound that the sound would, would come out proper. So that, that was something uh, revolutionary. 
Now, we're going to get to the jazz singer a little bit later, but you should know that that's the first talkie. And uh, you'll hear how that played a very important role in Rosenblatt's life. Again, this is just a thing that affected his life dramatically. You had uh, Black Tuesday, the stock market crashed in 1929. So let me just take you through all you know, the recordings, then we'll take you into his life. So you see that the first records were cylinder records up until 1916. The 78 RPMs went until 1970. And uh, this is interesting. Uh, this is a, a recorded in Palestine. Okay? This is a, uh, a, uh, a record that is uh, 78 RPM. Haganah, Haganah songs. Palestine. That's prior to 1948. Okay, so uh, they did have recordings coming out of Israel, but they were not they were not that uh, uh, popular. 33s came out in 1948, and this was a revolution for Jewish music. Once they had these records, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But 48, I'm sorry, 45 RPMs. You remember these little records that had one song, one song on a side? Well, it's mainly for jukeboxes. It was really mainly for jukeboxes. And, uh, and this, believe it or not, is the prayers of Moses. This is Moshe Kusevitsky. So he did record, uh, that was around 1950, 1955. Some of you, it's interesting when I uh, speak to young people, I ask them, do you know what a cassette is? Yeah. They don't even know what a cassette is. Yeah. That's a cassette player. <laughs> but the interesting thing about this particular one is it's 120 minutes. In other words, it's two hours, which uh, if you know anything about CDs, you get 80, 80 minutes. Uh, after uh, one hour, you pretty much had it. But uh, interesting enough, I gave the uh, State of Israel Sound Archives 2,500 cassettes a few years ago, and they digitized them. Now, they were particularly <laughs> glad to get the cassettes because it was very simple to record a cassette. And so here in the States, you had a lot of people recording, and they never got to Israel. I mean, uh, so that was uh, records get to Israel, but the cassettes were rather rare. I have another 1,500 cassettes that I'm sending to Israel soon, which they'll uh, be digitizing. And some of you remember the 8-track. I mean, that was, I, I don't know what happened to 8-tracks, but uh, it, it, was, it was just a short, a short life. Now, CDs came out in 1980. They're gone. You can, you can hardly find CDs today, because everything is on the computer. And pretty soon the computer will be gone, and who knows what the next thing is going to be. But what's interesting is all the music that has been recorded on all these different uh, systems, if you will, have to be captured uh, today and, and digitized for the future. And uh, we, we have to do it before all these disappear, by the way. Because that's what happens. They get thrown out. The kids don't even know what to do. They don't even listen to it, so what can we do? Okay, let's talk about Yasla's world. Yes, let's go. Just as an aside, 
what they have tried to do with all the grates that recorded on these old records was to transfer them and, and purify them, if you will, from the scratches and so forth. And what they did in the process is uh, they, they took out the beauty of, of the voice, if you will. Uh, I didn't want to bring the old Victrola to play because uh, it's a schlep, but if you ever dug that needle, that steel needle into this, they've never been able to duplicate it electronically. Uh, in other words, they try to remaster it. As a matter of fact, uh, somebody in Borough Park, I know the guy, he sat in front of the table and took out all the little uh, scratches, if you will, pure music, and lost something. Okay, so this is Rosenbach. Got to talk about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was from 1866 to 1917, 1916, 1917. You have the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you have the German Empire, on the, uh, let's see if this is going to work here. Here's the German Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and here's the Russian Empire. Uh, in 1900, there were 54 million people living in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, two and a half million Jews. But if you look at the geography, you had Germans, Hungarians, Czechs, Poles, Ukrainians, Romanians, Croatians, Serbians, Slovaks, even Italians. You had a mishmash, the, the, uh, the boundaries just kept changing. You didn't even know which country you, you were born in after a while. Um, here you see the breakout of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. You have Austria, Bohemia, Moravia, Galicia, Hungary, Transylvania, Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Slavonia. Uh, and each of these areas uh, had their own language, their, their, own, their own issues. But the Austro-Hungarian Empire was uh, pretty good. Uh, Franz Joseph was pretty good to the Jews even though he was a, a German, he wasn't a, a Nazi German. Uh, so th this is the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I just want to point out Bukovina right here. The reason I point that out is my father was born in Bukovina. Uh, we were told it was Romania at the time, but okay. Uh, so there are two coincidences in my life with Rosenblatt. One is that I happen to have hundreds of his records. Two, that my father, uh, was born in uh, uh, where Rosenblatt was raised as a child, and we'll get to the third one in a little while. So here we have Vyola Cherkov. This is in uh, the Ukraine. It's, it's actually uh, Russia, but it was in Ukraine. He was born in 1882. Uh, his father was a Hussite, a Russian Hussite. He was the first boy after nine girls. And then subsequently, there was a brother that was born uh, after that. He accompanies his father at the age of four. What happened was the father was a choir leader, and they used to have choir practice in their home. He heard the singing, and after a while, at four years old, he was singing, and they discovered they had this great voice. He was a boy wonder. He joined the choir at the age of seven. Uh, at the age of seven, in 1889, they moved to Bukovina, uh, Sadagora. That's uh, right there, uh, I guess you might say, Slovenia uh, and Ukraine. Uh, Chernowitz. That was in 1889. This is a uh, postcard from Bukovina. And you see here, Buk Bukovina. Bukovina. Anyway, uh, a few years ago I was in Israel uh, with my wife and we were in Jerusalem and all of a sudden I see this, this uh, Hasidic uh, Shtibol, oh, I thought it was Shtibol, Hasidei Sadagura. So there, there's still a, a presence of the Sadagura and uh, uh, Hasids. Uh, by the way, uh, just as an aside, I'm very active for Israel. Um, my wife takes a group twice a year. We go to only the beautiful places, Hebron, and uh, Yel, and Chai Sarah will be there. Uh, but you know, we just heard it's not Jewish. You heard that one, that the uh, grave of the patriarchs are, are, are Palestinian now. <laughs> That's a little crazy. Okay, okay so now in, uh, in 1894, 
uh, when he was uh, 12 years, uh, was he 1882? Uh, how old was he there? 12 years old. He goes to Bresco. Now, this is important, what's Bresco all about. He meets Taubla. Taubla was this young lady. Uh, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. He writes his first composition at age of 14. He was unique among cantors because he, he composed 500 compositions. But most cantors are not that musical that they can even compose one. So he was spectacular not only as a singer, but as um, a composer. So what happens in 1900? He goes to Munkach uh, in Hungary, and he applies for a job, and they say, I'm sorry, can't hire you. Anybody want to guess why? He wasn't married. So, the, 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 by the way, that was a requirement in, in many uh, instances throughout the, uh, the religious Jewish world. They didn't want to hire Cantor. Who, that makes a lot of sense, because you hear a lot of sad stories about Cantors who weren't married uh, today. And they should have that ruling. Uh, anyway, he goes and uh, marries uh, in 1900, when he was 18 years old. Here's a picture of Taubola at the age of 18 in Munkach. They can't stand it there. The Munkach or Hasidim were just so over the hill, strict, uh, unreasonable, whatever you want, and they couldn't wait to get away. So they go to Pressburg with Bratislava, where he is uh, there from 1901 to 1906. Now, if you look at this back, Everything from here east is the world of Hasidim, a, a, a whole different world. But as you get here, Pressburg, right next to here's Pressburg, right next to the Austrian border, you have the German influence, which is uh, the Reformation that was uh, uh, an influence. Uh, he stays in Bratislava for those years, those five years, but Tabula can't stand it because the sisters, you have to understand, he was a one-man charity institution. All his nieces, all his nephews, uh, uh, the whole family, the eight or nine sisters, whatever it was, he supported them, he supported the, the parents and so forth, but the sisters were always around and wouldn't let Tabula more or less uh, have her husband to herself. So they were pretty happy, uh, and he was also, also always needed more money. So he goes to, well, here he's in, in uh, Hungary. Oh, but uh, during that year, uh, 1905, 1906, he does his first recordings. And then he goes to Hamburg in 1906, where he stays to 1912. This is the little shul that uh, he dogged in, in Hamburg. It was rather uh, grandiose, to say the least. And uh, he had problems there. They wouldn't let him repeat words. They wouldn't let him sing in any concerts. But they did allow him to record. Uh, but they also wanted him to uh, sing in the manner of Lewandowski and, um, you, you know, uh, Salzer, Salzer and Lewandowski, who had the influence in the ninth, uh, 19th century, in the 1800s, you know, they changed the whole course of Jewish, uh, Jewish music uh, among the non-Orthodox uh, Hasidim and the Hasidim. Okay, in 1912, he comes to the United States, 50 West 120th Street. Uh, this is uh, a home where every Friday night there must have been 30 or 40 people uh, for dinner. They say at 11 o'clock Friday, the line started to form in front of his house. Any person who came for a charity, every person got somewhat, something from him. As I say, he was a, a one-man uh, charity. He... Uh, his shul was Ohef Sedek, which was in Harlem. 10,000 per year is like uh, 300,000 today in, in today's dollars. It was astronomical. Uh, the average worker in those days earned $5 a week. 
So you, you know, uh, to earn 10,000 was, was really something. This is the uh, first Hungarian congregation of Sedek. It started in Houston. I know all you New Yorkers, New Yorkers you know this. Uh, Houston, in Norfolk, then 116th Street, and then in 1926 they moved to their current uh, location on West 95th Street. Okay, 1912, the Titanic sinks. He makes a record. Gail Mullen for the Titanic. Concert. 